Elon finally got around to doing his Starship presentation last night, and Starlink has encountered some roadblocks in space. I'm Kevin, reporting to you from South Padre Island near Starbase, Texas, and this is SpaceX in the News. In preparation for Elon's Starship presentation this week, SpaceX moved Starship 20 between the orbital launch tower's booster-catching arms, nicknamed the Chopsticks, for its first ever lift to stack the second stage vehicle on top of Super Heavy Booster 4, and La Padre's cams were on top of it to capture it all. Then the following evening on Wednesday, the tower's Starship quick disconnect arm was retracted from the booster to make way for the lifting. Starship was hooked into the Chopsticks and SpaceX began to write history raising her up and integrating her to her booster over the time span of a couple hours. A process that will no doubt quicken over time as it's perfected. Elon was kind enough to twat out some of his own views of the event, including some screenshots of the monitors that they were, well, monitoring, as well as some drone footage of the drone you just saw flying around that was inspecting the process to make sure everything is terminal. The ship was hooked up and ready to go, ready to go nowhere by morning. Again, this fully stacked Starship Super Heavy is just for show. It's not going to orbit, at least not yet. But as you look at it, just think to yourself, if humanity is in fact destined to step foot on Mars, this will be the horse we ride in on. Not this exact one, but one like it. I was blessed to receive an invite back to this year's presentation last night. First time since 2019, and I gotta tell you guys, when the media bus was pulling up to the launch site and I got to see this beast up close in person for the first time, all flooded with lighting against the night sky, making all those all too familiar venting noises. Intimidating was the first and still the only word that comes to mind to describe it. It reminded me of the Tower of Terror at Disney World, if Elon had pumped it full of roid rage, like Godzilla or King Kong. Something you just can't believe is actually real even though you're right there staring at it. It's just incredible that the men and women at this event managed to build such a monster of a rocket. Seriously, pictures and video don't do it justice. Most of us who have been following Starship development for years did know most of what Elon presented during the presentation, but I consider it a good thing that all the drastic changes to the rocket that we used to be informed were happening are no longer happening and SpaceX now has a clear path to execute. But if you did pay attention, there were still some golden nuggets we walked away with. And I don't just mean updated Starship B-roll that I can now use in future videos, which I am very thankful for, but intel concerning Raptor 2 development as well. Uh, Raptor 2 is 230 tons of thrust, and I think over time uh, we can get that to probably 250 tons. And it's also um, significantly simplified while also increasing thrust at the same time. So it's it actually, um, Raptor 2 costs about half as much as Raptor 1, despite having much more thrust. Uh, and I think just generally being um, a, a much easier engine to build uh, and a more robust engine. We also heard an update about the possible 2022 plans for one of the sea oil platforms, Phobos or Deimos. We're going to take uh, one of them and, and, and build at least a catch tower on it. And Elon's contingency plan if the FAA does decide they need to do an entirely new EIS at the end of this month. It, it, would, it would obviously set us back uh, for quite some time because uh, an EIS takes a lot longer than uh, an EA. Um, uh, so we would, we would have to shift our priorities to uh, Cape Kennedy. During our pre-presentation live stream, I told you guys that that was my primary question that I was going to ask the Musk man on your behalf. So when it was my turn with the mic, I decided to go with another one of your questions concerning crew starship. And also a lot of questions about starship's interior because we really haven't heard anything about that. Now the thing is, right now they're just focused on, you know, getting Starlink up there on a on a cargo starship, but it would be nice to hear some some down and dirty details about the interior crewed starship, right? So that's another good question. And last we heard, maybe a year or two ago, you were looking to hire Tesla employees to design the interior for starship. How's that going? <laughs> um, well, it, we, we, have, we aren't focusing a lot on the interior quite yet. I mean, that will be important down the road, but uh, our focus right now is just getting to orbit and proving out uh, return of the booster and return of the ship. So yeah, we got the answer I expected we would hear. 
but we do now know for certain that there's nothing going on behind the scenes with that, at least not yet. I wanna thank you guys for supporting the channel over the years. It's because of you I get to go to these things, and I always have a really good time meeting up with the familiar faces. And I even got my first ride in a Tesla, Model S Plaid. Popped my cherry and blew my mind as it threw me into the sea. I almost died. I did talk about my entire Starbase experience on Rumble last night when I got back to the hotel, and I'll be sharing more behind the scenes clips I took on Locals later today. So if you're interested, I left some links in the description below. Okay, concerning Starlink news. On February 8th, SpaceX shared on their website that their latest flock of Starlink satellites placed in orbit just days prior became collateral damage of nature and physics. After deploying them in an orbit with their perigee, or lowest point, at 210 clicks above the Earth, where they would then use their onboard ion thrusters to increase altitude, the satellites encountered a geomagnetic storm. These storms caused the atmosphere to warm and densify, which increased drag on these space birds. To combat this increase in drag, the sats were pre-programmed to enter a safe mode and fly edge on to minimize the effects as much as possible. However, unfortunately, it wasn't enough for all but nine of the Starlink satellites, 40 of them re-entered the atmosphere and disintegrated as they are designed to do upon re-entry. Also on Monday and Tuesday, NASA and the National Science Foundation piled on the bad news with a letter to the FCC, outlining concerns that they have with the Generation 2 Starlink constellation. These are the upgraded and slightly bigger satellites with space lasers to be deployed on Starship. Ultimately, NASA is worried the massive constellation that could potentially reach 30,000 in number will create a significant increase in the frequency of conjunction events and possible impacts to NASA missions. Quote, NASA wants to ensure that the deployment of the Starlink Gen 2 system is conducted prudently in a manner that supports spaceflight safety and the long-term sustainability of the space environment. Well, that's all for this week, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. And a very special thank you to those of you who are or have supported the channel on Locals, Rumble Rants, Super Chats, uh, Patreon, YouTube membership, or just buying merch on the eccentric store. I'm here because of you. But now I'm going to go hop on a plane and head back to the lawyer, wife, and pups. You guys have a nominal weekend. And until next time, Godspeed.